a lesson number 11. As we begin, I'd like to ask um, Jared if he would lead us in a word of prayer. I think it was Friday night, um, Rachel and I w went to Cracker Barrel to eat, and I told, I told Glenn and Linda, I said, I, I can make an illustration out of this somewhere. The preachers use everything that happens somewhere, but um, they happened to come in a little bit later, but it wasn't that crowded, but it was, it, Cracker Barrel was always kind of moving slow, you know, but we, we um, placed our order, and I had not ordered a breakfast there in years, so I they had a little breakfast special thing. They had grits and eggs, and they had a sirloin steak. And I go, well, that sounds good. So I ordered that, and I always order my steak medium well, medium well. I, I, I don't want any mooing taking place, you know. I just, um, I, but I still want it juicy. So anyway, it took forever. No offense to them, but I mean, it just, it just took a long time. And finally, they brought it out, and it looked good. I mean, it looked really good. I cut into that steak, and I won't describe how much came out of that steak, and how rare that steak was, but it was, they had just kind of, and it was done. And it just was not where I, per, you know, of course, Jared's had it look perfect for what he'd want when, when I showed him a picture later, but I, I, I finally called the girl over and she goes, well, I can send it back if you want me to. And I go, I, I, yeah, I would like for you to. Well, by the time my steak came back, the next time I'd already eaten the rest of the food, you know, it was already gone. And I thought, okay, I'm eating steak for dessert. Well. I cut into it again, and if it could get rarer, <laughs> it, it was more rare than it was. I don't know what, I, maybe it warmed it up enough that it got the juices, it, it looked even worse than the first time. And I cut several times just to make sure it wasn't me. I let Rachel look at it, make sure. Anyway, I just, um, I looked at it and the girl came back and she looked and she goes, is there a problem? I said, and she looked at the place, she goes, it's not done, is it? And I, I said, no, and she goes, well, I'll get you, I go take, send it back. I said, I don't, I'm not, I'm not, no, no, no. And she goes, I'll get you something. Else. I said, at this point, we're, we're fine. And, I, and, I'm, I, and she, she apologized. I said, it's not your fault. And I said, I said you know, whoever's cooking this doesn't know what it means to have medium well, you know, or whatever. And I'm always afraid to say well done because I don't want to burn. But anyway, it kind of went, uh, the, the, the end of the story, they did, um, they did wine. She, she, got, she came back out later and she goes, um, we just gave you your meal for free. You know? And um, anyway, she wanted to know if I want to take the steak with me. I said, that's okay. It's just... It's, it's, it's gone, but anyway, I, I, I wound up, I, I appreciated the lady that waited on us, and I told her, I said, I'm going to give you, I said, I'll give you a nice tip. Well, when we left, I gave her what I considered a nice tip, you know, I, I left it on the card, and Rachel said, you know, we consider that a nice tip. When you said nice tip, she's probably expecting big bucks, you know, and I said, thanks for ruining my good moment, but you know, all that was said to say this, sometimes things don't turn out the way we want to, sometimes people misinterpret things we say. And, um, you know, or misinterpret, like, their definition of well done is far different from my definition of or, or medium well or whatever. Um, we can look at two different things. I look at that steak and thought, there's no way I can eat it. Others look at it and say, boy, that is wonderful. That's perfect. In fact, some people would probably say it's overdone. But, um, and that's, that's fine when it comes to eating, when it comes to meals, when it comes to our selections in life. You know, what kind of car are we going to get? What color, what color are we going to get? Where are we going to live? Those are choices you can have your opinion and my opinion on. But as we look at the book of Jude, we'll, we'll see that a lot of folks back then, just like today, had their interpretation or their opinion on how things should be. I mean, th they could look at the scripture and then they come up with something different. Or, or they, they twist what the scriptures had to say to fit what they wanted to say. And that was a problem back in the days of Jude. And it's a problem today as well. But when it comes to stakes or whatever else, we can have our different opinions there. But when it comes to God's word, we don't just have our own opinions. I mean, it's got, when it comes to doctrine, there is doctrine. There is truth. And that's one thing Jude does emphasize. There's truth that's there that we need to contend for, that we need to stand for, which means we can know the truth. And, and we must stand for it. So there is there. there there's truth that's there. Now, there's some things that are matters of opinion, of course, but there is doctrine. 
there's true doctrine, there's truth that's there. And so um, this book will really emphasize that. We've seen that some in um, the two epistles of John that we um, studied a moment ago. But we'll, we'll begin, it's really about, I know it's three or four lessons that are on Jude. The first one kind of introduces our character, the characters here and um, looks at some background and then we really dive in a little bit more. Any comments before we get into the book? As you look at the first part, Jude, a bond servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James. Who is Jude? What do you know about him? The brother of Christ? Okay. You know, it's kind of interesting, and we'll, come, we'll show some things about that in a moment. If he is the brother of Christ, why didn't he say so? Why, you know, why did he or James not say the brother of Christ or brother of Jesus? They had while he was here on earth, didn't they? Yeah. I mean, they had rejected him all through his life here on earth and his ministry. It was after his resurrection that you begin to see that faith there in Jesus. Did it, did it serve them any... Um, I'm trying to think of the good word to use. Did they score any points, I guess you might say, or whatever, for being his half-brother, really? I mean, having the same mother, a different father. Did that, did, did that, was there any bonus points for them in, in a sense of um, their spirituality or anything? I mean, I guess you could say from being around such a good man. Yeah. The, Right. Yeah, like I said, as Jerry, I mean, Jimmy said, and, and, you know, it wouldn't, and like you say, being a bond servant supersedes being a half-brother. Uh, I mean, we'd, we'd look at it the other way around, but just because a person could, could claim a physical connection to Jesus, you know, I'm his half-brother, I'm his half-sister, I'm his mother, well, I was his earthly father, whatever it may be, that's not what was important. If if James or Jude or any of these others were not a Christian, if they were not a servant of Christ, a bond servant of Christ, then it would do them no good. I mean, that physical relationship would do no good. And so he emphasizes what's the most important. He said, I'm not, I'm not trying to show you, and he's kind of giving his credentials here. I mean, he's showing, you know, you need to listen to me. I'm a bond servant of Jesus Christ. Of course, he's writing through inspiration. Uh, talking about who's that? You, Jesus. yes, yeah, right, yeah. He, he's by God. right. So that's that's what's important. You're not sanctified because you happen to be raised in the same physical family. It's a spiritual. It's a spiritual connection that's there. And, and so we look at Jude, and, and he's saying, "Look, I'm a bond servant of Jesus Christ." He's come a long way, hasn't he? Go back and you, you look at go back to Matthew 13. Matthew 13. And let's see where we want to start at. Uh, uh, verse 53, Matthew 13, 53. Now it came to pass when Jesus had finished these parables that he departed from there. When he had come to his own country, he taught them in their synagogue so that they were astonished and said, where did this man get this wisdom and these mighty works? I mean, they weren't questioning his wisdom. They weren't questioning the mighty works he did. They just couldn't understand how he, Jesus, could be doing what he's doing and saying what he's saying. Is not this the carpenter's son? Well, really, he wasn't the carpenter's son, was he? Um, is not his mother called Mary and his brothers James, Joseph, Simon, and, and Judas? Which, I mean, you know, so you have James and then you have Judas, which would be another version of saying Jude. And his sisters, are they not all with us? Where then did this man get all these things? So they were offended in him. Why did that offend them? What were they thinking? You ever heard somebody get, to get, get they're getting above the raisin? <laughs> yeah. Here he is, raised with them, just working class person. And all of a sudden, he comes back claiming to be someone great and all this wisdom. And, and he, he was. I mean, yeah. He just functioned greatly. Right, okay, yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, he, you know, he, he made... He made claims as far as being the Messiah is concerned at, at some point. I doesn't say that what all he said here. But they, they, they were amazed. Like you say, he just began to talk. And that's true. The only thing that mentions that he did here, he, read the, he would read the scripture. And then that, the, the way they would normally do it, you'd read the scripture, they'd make comments on it. And they, they saw a wise person. You ever heard somebody try to make comments on scripture and you realize they don't know what they're talking about? They could tell he did and he could explain it. Yeah, I mean, you know, getting a little uppity or whatever. And he, 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 I mean, he just came and explained the scriptures to them, you know, or, or showed his wisdom and did mighty works. And again, those works were to prove who he was and that what he is saying is the truth. But all they could see is, here's the carpenter's son. Here's, the, you know, the one that was raised with Mary, Mary and Joseph's children. Hey, he's, one of, he's one of them. He's one of us. Not really, you know, nothing wrong with that at all, but not expecting him to come back claiming, maybe making claims to be someone great or acting like someone um, that, that's great. And again, it, Jer Jesus, if anyone could be arrogant, Jesus could because he is the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. But, you know, he showed great humility in all of his ministry. But, you know, I, I've mentioned before, you go back um, home, you, or you see people that you haven't seen since you were, you know, uh, like back in... You, you know, you go back to a class reunion or something, they still see you as that high school student, or they still see you, if, you know, I've gone back, and, and people that are older than me will see me and still think of me as the little, you know, little Mark or whatever. And they just don't see me where I am now. Hopefully I've improved a little bit along the way and learned a little bit. But we can see, you know, he comes back home, and here's the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of God, talking to them, and that, should, that was a great opportunity for them to be there, but they were offended in him. They, they, just, they, they still saw little Jesus being raised in, as a carpenter's son, learning carpentry, and they didn't see anything beyond that. And it wasn't just them. I mean, it mentions the family as well. The family had a uh, difficult time comprehending you know, Joseph and Mary, if anyone could understand, it should have been Joseph and Mary. They knew where Jesus came from. They knew the full story uh, of him being the son of God and um, that Joseph was not the father. They, they understood that, if, if anyone could. Did they fully comprehend all the implication of that? I don't know what all they totally comprehended. I mean, she kept certain things. When he said, I must be about my father's business, you know, she kept those sayings in her heart. I mean, she... I mean, it's some bewildering things of what the implication would be. But you could... There were not Bibles in every home like there are now. For them to learn. No. And that, Jesus already knew. Right. Yeah, I mean, they didn't have... We take it for granted. I mean, you know, we may have two or three different versions, you know, different versions of the Scripture, different... Um, if you're like me, you have some that are larger print, or you put on your glasses to read, but, but we have... You can, you can, if, I, if I'm having a hard time sometimes on a verse I hadn't used in a while or, or looked at in a while, I'm saying, now where is that? You can get on, the, you can get on your phone or the internet and boop, it pops up and tells you where it's at. You know, and um, they didn't have any of that. They didn't even have like the written scripture in every home. And that, then, then again, they only had the Old Testament scriptures at this point uh, that Jesus was born. So, and they prophesied about him and showed clearly who he was, but still... We're looking at it in hindsight and can see it more clearly. But Jesus, where did he get that wisdom from? I mean, he, did, was, he, um, was he trained at the feet of Gamaliel like Saul? No. Did he go off to some place of higher education? No. Like you said, he, he, he had heard the stories, and I'm, I'm sure in the synagogue it, had, had, been, had heard the explanations, but how did he, how did he get to be so wise? It, came from, it was, came from God. It is that he is the, the eternal word who has made flesh. Other thoughts? Yeah, I mean, you know, sometimes we can be very prejudiced, um, and, and that's not just a black-white issue. I mean, we can be prejudiced for other reasons, you know, against people. And we, we get our mind made up about who somebody is or what they're like, and um, it can blind us to the reality. And I think they already had their mind made up who Jesus was because they'd, they'd seen him born, you know, raised up there in Nazareth. And um, all the way up in what his ministry began, about 30 years of age, so they'd been around him a long time. And... 
You'd think, though, somewhere along the way they could have seen, they, they probably had to have known he was a good man, good man and an honest man. Right. Yeah, when he went to the temple and, yeah, there in Jerusalem and, and heard that. Now, of course, this is over in Nazareth, but still, you think word gets back around. And, and some, some of those were with, were with him at that point. So, yeah, I mean, yeah. Um, when he confounded the religious leaders, <laughs> then the common folks surely got a little confounded. Yeah, that, that, it should have stood out there. Right. But, you know, it'd be kind of hard to say, we've been looking for the Messiah all this time, and he's right here in amidst us, but they should have seen it. But, you know, you look at his family in John chapter 7. John chapter 7, verse um, 2. Now the Jew, John 7, 2. Now the Jews' feast of tabernacles was at hand. His brothers therefore said to him, Depart from here and go into Judea, that your disciples also may see the works that you're doing. For no one does anything in secret while he himself seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. It sounds, it depends, you know, it'd be nice to hear the tone of voice they're using because you could read that, that just, if you stop there, it sounds pretty good. Like, Jesus, we believe, you know, we believe in you, we're excited for you, but you need to get it out there on the street. Let everyone know. Everyone's going to believe if you just tell them. But if you could hear the tone of their voice, it says in verse 5, for even his brothers did not believe in him. They're mocking him. Oh, go out there and let the world know who you are, Jesus. I mean, um, so that your disciples can, can see the works that you're doing. I mean, there, here's his brothers, really half-brothers, making fun of him, not truly believing in him. And so, I mean, you, you'll begin to, you look at him all through his public ministry, you see things such as that. Um, you go back to Mark chapter 3. Mark chapter 3. And verse 20, Mark 3 and verse 20. Then the multitude came together again, so they could not so much as eat bread. I mean, yeah, he, busy man. It, it, it was with great difficulty he'd go off and take time to pray or to be alone, or even now to take time to eat. They'd go from one place to another, and the multitudes figured out where he went to, and they'd follow him. And <clears throat> so the multitude's there. Verse 21, but when his own people heard about this, they went out to lay hold on him. When his family heard what he was doing and the crowds were following, they go to get Jesus, for they said, he is out of his mind. <laughs> you ever had a family member tell you you're out of your mind? <laughs> uh, you, know, um, you don't have to make confessions here, by the way, on that one. But, you know, I mean... Sometimes we, family can be the most loving and sometimes they can be the most vicious as well. Or sometimes maybe the most judgmental uh, because they see you, they see the good and the bad, the beautiful and the ugly. Uh, now Jesus didn't have bad. I mean, he was not a deceitful person or a dishonest person. Uh, but still to take him for granted and to think, Kind of like Joseph and his brothers. I mean, of course, Joseph is not on a scale with Jesus, but Joseph, those dreams were from God that made his brothers jealous. And, um, of course, he was jealous of the father's attitude, but that wasn't Joseph's fault. We don't know all about his attitude, but still, you know, you look at Jesus, and he's living a perfect life, and then he begins his ministry to seek and save the lost, including his family, trying to reach them. And they look at him and said, he's out of his mind. Don't you imagine... That would hurt. You know, when you have family members that don't really believe in you or family members that get at odds with you, it can hurt. Um, and especially if you know that the things that, if, that they're saying are not true or the trouble they're causing is not based on truth. And here he is trying to do what is right. Well, not just trying, but doing what is right. And here's his family just saying, you're out of your mind. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem said, He has Beelzebub, and by the ruler of the demons he cast out demons. And, and so he, he confronts them. And, and so they look at him and just say, He is out of his mind. Um, of course, at one, one, on one occasion when they came to get him, they said, You know, your family's outside. Your mother and your, your, your 
brethren are outside. What did Jesus say then? Who is my brother? Who is my mother? You know, who is my family? And said, you are. And, uh, you know, so I mean, he looked beyond those physical connections because, I mean, and, and they, they had a difficult time believing in him. And again, I may have asked this, I think I asked this, why, we asked about the people in Nazareth, why would his family have such a difficult time believing in him? Why would his brothers and his, you know, and all, why would they have such a difficult time? Okay. Growing up, he, you know, I guess you could, you could look at things and say he was different in the sense of his character, maybe. But you look at, as far as growing up, everyone out there, everyone could see the son of Joseph and Mary, even though he's not the son of Joseph. They would see the carpenter's son. I mean, just a normal family, they'd think. But then, like you say, when, they, when he comes back, all of a sudden he is just so different than, than them at this point. It, it can be, can it? Uh, why do you think that is? <laughs> yeah, you talk to a, a family member about becoming a Christian, and they'll look at you, who are you to tell me what to do, or I'm just as good as you are, or what, you know, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And so, uh, I mean, that can happen to, you know, if you've ever talked to, and, and sometimes though, someone will, will take, to, you know, hopefully they have a good heart and will take it from what, it's not you, it's the God's word. But, I mean, we can, we can see that difficulty in our own families of approaching someone who's not a Christian. And so here he is in this, fam, in this family, and I'm not making excuses for them. They still should have been able to see and understand. And especially when he comes on the scene, not just with great wisdom, but with those mighty works. I mean, Jesus makes a point to these here, saying, can Satan cast out Satan? You know, I mean, no. I mean, a house fight against itself won't stand. I mean, Satan wouldn't cast out Satan. It, it's the power of God, not the power of Satan that he's using. And they, they should have been able to see that. But they had a difficult time seeing it. You go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And, I mean, it tells you the very foundation of the gospel. I like this, 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preach to you, which also you received, in which you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast that word which I preach to you, unless you believe in vain. And he said, here's the basic foundation of all that we teach, of all that we believe, of all that we stand in. He says, I deliver to you first of all that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scripture, that he was buried, and that he arose again the third day, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And this is really a, you know, a great resurrection chapter. I mean, it talks about Christ rose up and will rise up, will rise up eventually never to die again. And in this, though, he says he showed himself alive. He was seen by Cephas, then by the twelve. After that, he is seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain to the present, but some have fallen asleep. That was at the time this was written. After that, he is seen by James, then by all the apostles, then last of all, he was seen by me also as one born out of, of due time. So he was seen by the apostles. He was seen by, mentions James here, you know, uh, the ones that were witnesses to the resurrection. And you've got to imagine as, um, as his brethren began to realize, hey, you know, his brothers began in this, in this family realized, you know, he died, you know, because of the things that he said, because of his ministry and, he, he died on the cross, but then three days later, all of a sudden, I realized he rose up from the dead. Wouldn't that get your attention? I mean, all those other works should have. All of his teaching should have. His, his manner of life should have. But when he rose up from the dead and so many witnesses to it, at that point, I think they had to stop denying it. Do what? That was the proof. That was the proof. Mm -hmm. 
But when his mother comes back and says, I saw him on that cross. I saw, you know, saw the, the spear pierce his side. Yeah. Right. Right. If you have an honest heart, you shouldn't be able to at that point. I mean, you know, but. Yeah, the only one that we know that did was Mary. I mean, as far you know, Mary was there at the cross. But now, as far as and how long she stayed there, I don't, it doesn't say. But long enough to know. Right. If he kind of moseyed on off with her or whatever. Uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, yeah, because there's nothing, yeah, that is a good point. It's nothing that shows for sure that any of the others were there other than Mary. Yeah, I mean, well, you, you know, where were the rest of the apostles? <laughs> Peter followed a little ways off, but then when he denied the Lord and the rooster started crowing, he went off and was crying. So you only have John there uh, at the cross that we know of. But as far as... Yeah, I mean... You can see the, the nail prints. You could see the, the side. The proof was there. And um, so you got to hand it to them. It seems that you, know, that you have at least a couple of examples there of those that became... That, um, became disciples that became Christians um, within his family. Uh, nothing's mentioned of his father's. You know, it makes you almost wonder if he had already died at this point. He, it's possible. We don't know what happened to, um, to Joseph. He's not mentioned. Um, you just have, like, um, with James and Jude that are mentioned. And by the way, Jude, James is mentioned first in the list, and Jude the last. Some say that's prominence. Others say it's the birth order. We don't know. I mean, you can put it... You can put a lot of stock into the order things are mentioned in, but how you interpret that part, I mean, it, you know, it doesn't really say, but they are his half-brothers. We, we do know that. But you get over to um, Acts chapter 1 and verse 12. Acts 1, 12. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the Mount called Olive, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey, and went... The, you know, and when they went into the upper room where they were staying, Peter, James, John, and Andrew, Philip, and Thomas, Bartholomew, and Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon, the zealot, and Judas, uh, the son of James, these all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. So they're there then. Um, you know, after, after, the resur after the resurrection of Jesus, like, like Mike said, they showed the proof. He showed the proof to them of who he was and he had risen from the dead. And now um, they're, they're, there in they're there in Jerusalem waiting. Um, they're waiting for the day of Pentecost. They're waiting I mean, for the, 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 well, the Holy Spirit's going to come on the apostles and they'll begin to teach and preach. But um, it's interesting that as they're waiting, there's others there with them. And among that number of those is his mother and his, his brothers are there. So things are turning. Things are changing. Uh, those that did not believe now with honest hearts have no choice but to believe. The one that we mocked, the one that we ridiculed, the one that we looked down on and said he was out of his mind, he is who he claimed to be. He is the Son of God. And he rose up from the dead. But you know, it's no different than Saul who became Paul. I mean, he persecuted Christians caused them to blaspheme, put them in prison, sent them off to the death, and yet the blasphemer turned into the proclaimer of Christ. And so here's family members that took him for granted and mocked him that are now um, coming to faith in him. Other thoughts on that? Go back to the book of Jude again. Jude, a bondservant of Jesus Christ. Again, we mentioned that that relationship was more important um, what does it mean to be a bond servant of Jesus Christ? Totally subjected to him. Totally to him. On page 104, if you have a class book, I like the way, what Guy and Woods had to say here uh, about bond servant, that it designates one who gladly surrenders his will to another, a disposition not always characteristic of, of literal slaves, but eminently true of all who resign their wills to that of the Lord. The service is absolute 
and unrestrained, but willing and rendered from motives of love and gratitude and joy. He is a bond servant. He has given his life in service to, to Christ, submitted to Christ's will. You know, not, not, not my will but thine be done was the attitude of Jesus. And as a bond servant of Christ, Jude's attitude was the same thing. And he, so his most important relationship is that with Christ and showing that, you know, I'm a, I'm a Christian. I'm a servant of Christ. I, you know, I'm not claiming to be preeminent because I'm his brother. No, it's a matter of being his servant. Now, he does mention being a brother of James. Why would that be important? To show his connection to James. There may be something, um, there, there may be um, something um, to the fact that James was a little bit more prominent. Um, you know, James was, is, you look at Acts, um, he's there in what, Acts 15, and some other places. I mean, you look at uh, taking a prominent role within the church there at Jerusalem, evidently, and people might recognize his name more quickly than they would Jude, and so just maybe mention, you know, I'm the Jude, and there'd be more, a lot of Judes or Judases around as well. I'm Jude, the brother of James, you know, and you know who James is as far as the church is concerned. And so, I mean, he's, he's making sure they understand who he is, that this, you know, this is not just his, his word, it's God's word, I mean, that, that he is a, a faithful Christian, that he is, um, but just who he is as well as far as the brother of James is concerned. And so he's, he's saying, you know who I am, I'm Jude, and we can, deduced from that as well that he's the half-brother of Christ. Who is he writing to? To those who are called, sanctified by God the Father, and preserved in Jesus Christ. How are we called? I got in a conversation with somebody the other day about being, uh, they got talking to me about being called. By hearing and believing in the gospel. By what? By our belief, by hearing and believing the gospel. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Um, you know, I, I had a denominational preacher talk to me the other day, and he was talking about his call, how he was called the Lord. And he, he goes, now, what about you? When were you called? How were you called? And I, I explained to him about the Word of God calling me. You know, and oh, and he, he thought he had to have a personal experience there of some type of a, uh, you know, an, a voice or a, some kind of emotional, at least some kind of emotion that you felt or whatever. And, and I told him, I said, it wasn't one moment. It, it kind of built. And, 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 but it was, I said, it, it came from an understanding of God's word. And, uh, and, you know, and, and God working within my heart, yes. But I meant not, you know, but it's not a, it wasn't like a, a still small voice or a loud shout or anything like that. It, I think some people look for that. Um, I, was re um, I was reading an article online. Um, it's, it's about the, the things going up, the, up in Kentucky, that where's that place? Asbury, where they had all that stuff going on. Well, back during the time of the restoration movement, that same type thing happened at Cane Ridge, and um, it was the Methodists that were doing that, and um, they had a great number, and they had the little mourners bench that you go up to and, and pray for God to save you and give you those feelings and all. And the person that was writing this. Um, was a, a, a person that was involved in that, and they said some Campbellite preacher showed up. That's why they put it instead of you know in what church. I just said a Campbellite preacher showed up and tried to convert people. And by the end of the article, he goes, "I'm happy to say that we converted 17 Campbellites." You know, and uh, you know, got them to come down to the mourners bench and and get that emotion built up and, and feel like they've been saved. And many people associate salvation in that way. It's and it should be an emotional thing. I mean, we should feel good because we're saved. But we don't necessarily know we're saved because we feel good. Uh, it's, it's, faith comes from the word of God, um, from the preaching and teaching of God's word. In the first century, even when they had those miracles, I mean, you think about all the miracles that took place as far as Saul is concerned, with the Lord appearing to him, the light blinding him, uh, being led by the hand. He saw a vision. Um, Ananias saw a vision. You know, had the Lord talk to him as well. Um, he miraculously healed his eyesight, but still he had to tell him what to do to arise and be baptized and wash away your sins. Cornelius, in that story, you look at the miracles on Cornelius' side and on, on Peter's side, but he said, you send for Peter, he'll tell you words by which you and your house will be saved. I mean, so the words would be there. It takes the preaching and teaching of God's word or the reading and studying of God's word. And, and so we're called. As we read God's word, we realize, hey, I'm lost in sin. 
But we also realize there's an answer to that found in Christ. And we understand who Jesus is and what he's done for us and what we must do to be saved. And, and so people will look anywhere and everywhere sometimes except for God's word. But we are called by the word of God. It, it's important. Other thoughts? What does it mean to be sanctified? What are some other words you could use there? What, the word sanctified or sanctification. Holy is another word. Christ-like. It means to be set apart. You know, literal is a set apart. I mean, that's what the idea behind holiness and like being Christ-like is. We are, um, I think Timothy said, you know, we're sanctified. You know, and Timothy says we're a sanctified vessel. Meat for the master's use. I think that's the way it was worded. Uh, we're, we're set apart to be used by God. And, and so he said, look, you're in the world, but don't be like the world. You're in the world, but you're here to serve, you know, to reach out to the world. You're, you're sanctified. You're not spotted by the world. You, haven't given, you don't give in to the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. To be set apart. People should be able to look at us and, and know by the manner of life that we live and the things that we teach and say and do that we are Christians. He said, but you've been set apart, not by man, you've been set apart by God the Father. It's God that sets us apart. Salvation comes from God. But you're preserved in Jesus Christ. What's it mean to be preserved? I guess it depends on what you're talking about. <laughs> do what? Saved. Saved? I, you know, um, you ever made preserves of any kind? Um, uh, you know, I, I can... Yeah, we, I've helped Rachel with some of the different things we do. She trusts me on some of it. Others, she, she knows better than to, to trust. But, you know, you get those jars sitting on the counter, and what do you hear after a while? That little ding, pop, that little pop sound. What does that mean? It's sealed. <laughs> and everything's preserved. Everything's good. You don't hear that pop. You might still can set it in the refrigerator and use it for a while, but it's, it's not preserved. It, hasn't, it didn't quite work like it was supposed to or whatever. Um, but, you know, you hear that popping sound. We're preserved. Come out of the or whatever a ping, but at the same time, there's that preserving that takes place. It doesn't mean once saved, always saved, but it does. That's it. Yeah, uh, the blood of Christ continually cleanses you. I mean, you're, there's that that you're preserved. I mean, we live in a world that's full of. Sin and unrighteousness is headed toward eternal damnation, but we are preserved in Christ. But the thing is, we have to, we have to I think it's down later in the book, let's say verse 21, keep yourselves in the love of God. I mean, you know, we're, we're supposed to walk in the light. We, we don't turn your back on Christ. You know, we can walk away from Christ. We can lose our soul after becoming a Christian. But if you're faithful to, I mean, if you just, if you'll just, Abide in Christ. I mean, you have it all. There's that preservation. There's that hope. There's that promise. It's in Christ Jesus. I mean, all spiritual blessings are in Christ. Everything's in Christ. Um, but um, he just says, understand what you have. There's mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. The book brings out a point about, it doesn't mention grace in there, but um, grace is there when you're talking about being preserved in Christ. The, you know, it's the sacrifice of Christ. It's the blood of Christ. It's God offering us what we need rather than what we deserve. You know, all of that's grace. All these things are, are a part of God's grace. But mercy, that's part of God's grace. I mean, we demand justice, but sometimes you just plead for mercy. There's peace, the peace of mind that passes, the peace that passes all understanding, peace that we can live with our fellow man as much as in us possible that we live at peace, peace ultimately with God, and, and love, loving God with all of your being to love your fellow man as yourself and he said look I want mercy peace and love to be multiplied to you and indeed in Christ there is a great multitude of mercy peace and love any comments on that introduction get down to verse 3 beloved while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation he said look I, I want to write I wanted to write to you about our common salvation it's a wonderful thing isn't it I mean to talk about salvation to talk about how with all the differences in our lives, the differences in our backgrounds, maybe our social level, whatever else it may be, with all our differences, we have something in common. We may pull for different sports teams, you know, but we have something in common. Salvation in Christ. And 
He said, that's really what I wanted to talk to you about. You know, sometimes there's things that you'd like to say to somebody, you know, that you'd like to talk about, and, and it's easy to talk about, enjoyable to talk about, but sometimes there's some things you need to talk about, and it may not be so easy. It may be a little more difficult. It may step on some toes. It may um, cause some friction or whatever, uh, but so, or sometimes it's just something, you know, look, I, I, I'm enjoying talking to you, but there's something I really got to talk to you about. You know, you try to talk to somebody, you small talk, and you go, look, I need to get to the point. There's something I need to talk to you about. He said, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. You know, I could talk about salvation, but he said, I need to talk to you about not losing what you have and not holding on to what you need to hold on to, that you need to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. It's something that we contend for. We do it earnestly. But also notice it says, the faith. It's not many faiths, it's the faith. The faith that comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. It was once for all delivered to the saints. And really, when you're talking about the faith here, it's in the sense of the system of faith, the revealed faith to us. It, one place says from faith to faith, the faith that's revealed here that produces faith within my heart. And he's saying it's once for all delivered. So what does that tell you, if it's once for all delivered? Is there going to be another gospel? No more, is it? Paul warned about that to the Galatians in Galatians 1. But there are some people today that claim they have another testament of Jesus Christ. They claim to have another gospel message. But, but in places like this, I said, look, it's been once for all delivered. And then you look at, um, you look at Paul warning the Galatians, like there's not another gospel. You know, you don't, don't believe that. And yet some still believe it, that they have the exception to the rule. And so he's saying, understand that some things are more important than others. I mean, oh, there's a lot of things we can talk about. But sometimes there's some things that are necessary at the particular time. Salvation is a wonderful thing to talk about. But he said a common salvation, how we all share it, Jew and Gentile alike, rich, poor alike, male and female alike. But he said there's some things you need to think about and, and understand. Why? It's because certain men have crept in unnoticed who long ago were marked out for the men who turned the grace of our God into lewdness denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. And we'll talk about what they were teaching in a moment. But false teachers have come in. And you need to stand firm in the faith. But we'll take up with verse 4 next week.